Well, it's really super nice for me to be here, but I realise that I've come 10 degrees south to get here. Not many people probably can say that when they come to Canada. Um, so, if I may, I would like to begin with a little story. Um, ooh, maybe three months ago, I had just the delight to take part in a research project um, on a ship sailing around the west coast of Scotland. It was, um, it was miraculous and for me very transformatory in many ways. Um, it was incredibly beautiful. You can see this is an image from the ship. This is the Gulf of Corryvecchian, um, a, the largest whirlpool in Europe. Would you believe it? Look how still it is. But it was so magnificent. So many were the landscapes to look at. The sky was just marvelous that during that time, um, my eyesight completely changed. I couldn't, after about three days on board, I could no longer read. I couldn't sew. I couldn't do anything that required close focus. So in the course of about four days of me staring at the horizon, I developed long-sightedness. And after that point, things completely changed for me because I realized up to that point at how much in my life I really preference the things that are close to eye all the reading, all the computer work, all the stuff that you do, which is actually nearby, close in your life, in the moment. And actually, what I did was the only thing I could do is I started to look far, to look long, which actually I couldn't do anything else at the time. So now I have glasses, um, which is a change. But actually, the real reason I'm telling you this is because for the last 20 years, I really have been trying to look at the big picture to start by looking at things in a holistic context and then to move down to the level of detail. But this new thing that my eyes have given me, this preference actually no longer for the short term, no longer for the close to hand, has completely changed the emphasis that I place on this big picture and the importance that actually when you look far, what it tells you about what is close to hand. And I think that's a really important lesson for us all. So to tie in with many of the points that have been made already, I'm going to talk about some big picture ideas and about perhaps the need for us to begin to shift our ideas and expectations about what fashion is within the context of sustainability. What I think, and I'm sure you probably agree, at least to a certain extent with this, is that the language and the expression of the consumer society in the clothes that we buy and the clothes that we wear is so overriding that we hardly notice it. So the prevailing consumerist style and story of fashion, it just appears natural to our way of thinking and our behavior. It's really normal to access and engage with fashion by exchanging money for products. Yeah, that's normal. It's expected that these same products will sort of perhaps look a bit out of date in about six months. And it's also really normal to discard rather than to mend. These things are sort of just typical. So ideas of progress have become tied to a societal narrative of growth through buying more garments. And of course, you know, we're told that growth is essential in order to maintain the stability of the economy. And the, so the social language of goods and status is really positioned, is really woven into the things that we buy. And then the fashion industry is shaped by this. The different approaches to production and manufacture are shaped by consumerist values. And the market domination of what fashion is has completely changed the industry. The ideology of more and cheaper has actually affected what we buy and how. So in the US over the last uh, 20 years, the price of clothing has fallen by 17%. And in, the, in Europe, actually, it's fallen by 26%. There's a massive reduction, which has made people effectively buy more. And how long things last is also triggered by the market's need to grow sales and to show positive returns on the bottom line. Everybody knows about uh, the built-in obsolescence of the fashion cycle, and that is used par excellence within the clothing industry. What we see is that we buy more because instant rewards are ever cheaper and easier to access. In the UK, 2 million tons of new clothing is bought every year. 
and 1.1 million tonnes. These are metric tonnes. I know there's been loads of pounds so far. 1.1 metric tonnes um, are discarded. And what you see here is that the volume that people have at home is just growing every year. The volumes aren't reflective of people's needs. They're just reflective of the business models of the system of fashion that we're working in. And this begins to dictate the nature of the garments that we buy and wear. So people end up being channeled into a way of thinking about fashion, which is high volume, low cost, uh, individualistic ways of forming identity. And fashion success is measured in sales figures, which shapes the way we dress. We buy things that are in the shops, and that makes more businesses crowd in and start providing for those things. And what we see is we see a new hierarchy of fashion provision, which displaces other options. Our expectations about what fashion is have been shaped by the things that we experienced in the past. It marginalizes other experiences. For example, public expectations um, about creating shared fashion are long forgotten. Most of the ideas that we have around fashion are shaped in the shopping mall. So sewing at home, which used to be something that was quite widely shared across social classes, across genders, has become increasingly restricted recently. And home tailoring and knitting, okay, it's enjoyed a revival in recent years, particularly in Europe, I imagine it's the same here, uh, perhaps linked to the recession. Um, that's either the preserve of specialist amateurs, the professional amateur, as it's sometimes called, the highly skilled person, or it's a badge of youthful experimentation. It's not actually a real bona fide alternative to making clothes. And sewing machine repair services, where in the UK there used to be at least one sewing machine repair service in every small community, now they're almost impossible to find, as are haberdashery stores, the places like where you buy the notions and the sewing thread and all these other things. They're always very far away from the sites of consumption of new clothes. And so people's ideas and expectations of buying fashion and fashion as shopping are very different to these other ideas and potentials of what fashion can be. What I think is that consumerism has really shaped our ideas about fashion, our expectations about it, and in the process it's squeezed out alternatives. It's made alternatives seem impossible. And this is because the cultural conditions we have create desire for the current setup that we have. Other things seem really expensive because we can't enjoy the economies of scale that the existing status quo can afford. They also seem undesirable because ooh, mm, the aesthetic maybe just doesn't quite fit in. Perhaps it's a little quirky. Or maybe they seem impractical because often these alternatives don't quite fit within the culture of comfort that we've all come to expect. But what I would like to say is that actually consumerist fashion um, isn't actually all that there is. It's a power structure. It's a business model. It's not necessarily what we need um, or the only thing that we can imagine. It's certainly not reflecting our genuine preference for dressing ourselves in lots of cheap products. Consumerism which is at the root of this tangle with sustainability and something that we absolutely need to talk about. Consumerism promotes a view of a very individualistic, autonomous world. By contrast, sustainability requires that we have a much more ethically enlarged view and that we think of things in different ways. And that's one ultimately based on taking responsibility. I think we all know that the real world is connected and interdependent, and that we have to begin to consider what fashion means within a world that isn't one that's solely based on consumerism. Estimates suggest that we are facing a tripling of global annual resource extraction and consumption by 2050. So UNEP, the United Nations Environment Programme, estimate that in order to maintain relative climate stability, all affluent nations need to reduce uh, resource consumption by up to a factor of five. That's about 95%. Is that right? 90, no, 90% uh, reduction in what we buy and use. 
And I've heard statistics actually that suggest it's about 97% reduction. And in the, the textile industry and the fashion industry, people have really been engaging with some of these challenges of reducing impact, like we've heard already this morning. And I would say that many of the things that have been going on are vital, and we need to do more of it. The, the new fibres that are being pursued, the new chemical processes, technical improvements in water and energy efficiency, supply chain initiatives, transparency, all of these things. And yet, even though this is much welcome, and that I'm sure that there has been a decline in the impact per garment produced over the last 10 years, I'm sure that there has been, during this same time, these improvements have been completely overshadowed by an increase in consumption. Any attempts that we've made to lessen the net impact of the fashion, in, of the fashion sector have been completely eroded by the fact that there are more garments in circulation now than ever before. People, including those environmentally friendly amongst us, have actually just, you know, we've bought more. Oh, it's just an eco one. Let's buy it. That's fine. But actually, what's it done? It's actually just increased consumption. Sorry, wrong way. Something slightly more insidious, perhaps it's done this too. It's what it's done, it's built a dependency that we have as individuals on market exchange. So buying organic cotton pyjamas for our children, or maybe a recycled polyester fleece jacket, it has the effect of building further dependency of our ideas about what fashion is based on buying more stuff. I would suggest that this has another effect. It reduces our ability to be self-reliant, to imagine what fashion is independent of this consumer system. And I would suggest that when that happens, we're less able to mark out our own path, not just through garments, but also through life because our dependency is entirely upon the goods that we buy rather than other things. And what happens, and this is something that perhaps is the root of all of our problems, is that a very narrow spectrum of activity of what fashion is and what we have to do is valued. Other systems of fashion provision and expression are forced into the shadows. I think you probably are all aware of this, um, but it bears saying again, that having more stuff doesn't make you happy. Um, certainly, there have been loads and loads of reports over the last 20 to 30 years which crunch the data on people's well-being. And this has been shown that actually, you know, affluence is a really important driver um, for increasing uh, well-being. And once basic needs have been met, which is really important, affluence then stops growing. Sorry, people's levels of well-being then stop growing, even if affluence increases. And the, very, the realization that we have is that whilst affluence has improved all of our happiness levels, more moderate affluence would have sufficed. Because if we'd stopped much, much lower down, we wouldn't have needed to continue to consume. So I suppose what I'm suggesting here is that I haven't actually talked really about any of the issues specifically to do with a fibre, perhaps even a fabric, or specifically a garment. But what I am saying is that if you're going to engage with fashion and sustainability, you have to take it on, not as a technical challenge, because actually we have many of the technical solutions already in place to engage with the sustainability issues that we are, we are talking about today. But ultimately, it's a political challenge. We just don't have the skills to begin to apply what we're talking about. And for me, what this is, this is negotiating a new set of social relations in fashion that's based on a responsibility to others. Arguably, all the things that we've been doing so far when we engage with sustainability have been happening sort of in separation from the world that's around us. And we have to sort of begin to change that. I think that there are two things that are really important as we begin this journey, which is much more political, not with a party politics sort of perspective, but with a, a politics as it affects all citizens. There are two things that I think are really vital. 
The first is that we acknowledge that fashion has a shared biography with consumerism. And we have to be very blatant about that. We have to acknowledge that it's given us many great things, that capitalism can deliver change at scale very rapidly, and that is worth embracing. We have to do that. We have to see us, see the sector for what it is, and we have to be prepared to talk about the effect that consumerism will have on all of the improvements that we make. And then the second thing that we have to do is something that's very bold, is that we actually have to stray out of that understanding. Effectively, we're sort of in a box at the moment where ideas of fashion and expectations of what working in fashion and fashion is to wear and fashion is to do have been shaped by a set of ideas that are largely based on economic, the logic of economic growth and consumerism. But that's not all that fashion is. And we should not be limited by those when we imagine what fashion is within a sustainability context. You have to include it, but not be limited by it. And straying out of this understanding is, I suppose, an opportunity to re-appreciate the potential of fashion to nourish and foster very different actions and to make charged political choices through our design and production decisions. And, and to do that in a way where we're completely open and realizing actually the bigger ramifications of what we're doing. So all of the images that you'll see from now on are from this project, Local Wisdom, that um, Linda mentioned. And I, every single one of them has a very poignant story, and in many cases a funny story, um, that talk about how the public, these are all photographs of the public, how the public use their clothes. But unfortunately, time is so short, I've already seen the five-minute sign that I'm not going to share these stories with you now, but another time, absolutely. But I just want to make a few other points. So that I would say is that so much effort goes into focusing on uh, uh, improving the sustainability profile of uh, garments up to the point of production. But actually, garments are influenced by forces that are far beyond the control of design and production. Um, and these are the, 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 the forces that are based on time and on a dependency with people and with context, with place. And to even begin to think about what these mean for fashion, we all have to sort of leave our baggage behind and then take this completely different view, even if it's just for a few seconds, it's a bit like when my eyesight went and all I could do was look to the long term. We need to adopt a much more broadening view, a, a, a view of the bigger picture so we can see what direction we're heading in here, which will help direct the detailed decisions that we make. I would say um, that our big opportunity is to see fashion as an opportunity to improve the human condition versus consumerism's opportunity to display and express the, con the human condition. This is, our, this is our point, this is our option now. Are we going to just express and display what it is to be human more, or are we going to improve what we've got? And I think, well, I know where I sit on that. And in order to do that, I'd say that this is what we have to do. We have to engage with economic systems, we have to engage with social patterns, and we also have to engage with what it is to be an individual in the everyday here and now. And this is what fashion doesn't do. We have to build an integrated picture of social and material assets and connections that are far beyond just understanding what happens up until the point of purchase. We have to link in with context and with people. So this project that Linda mentioned, it's uh, been going for about five years. Uh, I think it's something like 10 different uh, countries that I've been to talking to the public about how they use their clothes. And the point of it is to try to connect design with use as two sides of the same coin, two very powerful parts of a whole, and to begin to, to link in and suggest um, with better understanding about how we use things. What I would say as part of this sort of broadening view is that if we place fashion within a bigger context, the context of place, a context of people's lives, and also this realization that 
actually time is really important here. It's not just you buy a garment and then it's sort of lost. Actually, it goes on through an iterative, ongoing process of use in people's lives. This is, for me, a really important um, headline on this. And it's one of the things that's completely changed my um, outlook in recent times about what fashion and sustainability is. We all realize that, you know, garments are sold to us as a product. There's a big industry putting these things out there. But when they enter our lives, we live them as a process. And attending to that is, for me, essential. We have to realize that these aren't static objects, things that you make and then, oh yeah, someone will buy it and that's the end of it. It's matter in motion. It's rich in detail and, and mobility and vibrancy of human people's lives. Engage with that and what you see is that you're, you're engaging with garments as a structure for life to unfold in. And this makes a very subtle perhaps, but for me, vital distinction, is that actually what we're doing here when we're engaging with fashion and sustainability, so we're not thinking about objects, we're talking about agency. And perhaps, if anything, sustainability needs its agency, it's people who feel that they can affect change. So if a conversation that starts in a panel like this in the morning starts with objects and ends with agency, then I think we're in a happy place because what we're bringing is an understanding of a fashion system that's actually contingent on people, on context, on environments, on place, on a sense of real life because perhaps for too often fashion has been sort of um, removed from that. Being based on the flux and the actions of the everyday gives us something really nice because what it helps us do is imagine fashion which is carried out with other people in a very collaborative action. It blends and merges the boundaries that perhaps have too often been imagined. And this, um, this for me says so much. Our choice is to make the fabric and the garments that we create serve hearts of flesh, real people's lives, and to promote a sense of responsibility within that. There's so much to say in every one of these images. For me, I look at it and I'm always sort of blown away by the, the power that I see within all of these people's lives. But what they speak of is resourcefulness, because many of the things that these people are doing with their garments don't need any money or extra resources to make them happen. Um, they breed capabilities. Uh, and foster those. This guy is, is 82. Um, this is where I live. Um, not on a boat, but near there, um, in the north of England. And this guy has uh, remade this. I, I, I will actually just tell you this story. This is um, Mr. Edwards, and he, he came along with a very slim waistcoat, which I know that you guys... What, what is that over here? A vest, thank you. Um, uh, uh, yeah, he came with a vest that had been given, and he said, oh, yes, I was given this, and, you know, I used to wear it, and then I put a few pounds on, and so um, I decided that what I was going to do is I was going to slit it up the back to make a bit of extra room, so he cut it up the back. What a bold move. And then he knitted that panel <laughs> that he inserted in the back, and then he wore it like that, and then he decided, you know, this needs some sleeves. So he then <laughs> knitted two sleeves, and a waistband and a collar for this piece. And then he put on a few more pounds. Um, <laughs> and I don't have an image of the front, but what he then created was what he described to me as latchets. Leather latchets. So these sort of funny straps that bridge the divide. <laughs> and he put a sequin on each one. Um, and also, what you see in... Mr. Edwards and in Femi here, um, if you look at the website, you'll see the stories associated with these, is you see that there's a real sense of agency, a sense of power, uh, personal power, not like power over people, but I'm in my power with these things. And perhaps once again, if we're going to create anything within a fashion and sustainability system, this is, this is what we need to do. So if I was to say what we need to do within... Uh, here in Nova Scotia, or generally globally within fashion and sustainability, it would be this. 
is we need to create ideas about what fashion are and shape people's expectations that are reflecting the independency, interdependency of our situation. And this is many things. This is linking with nature and with, with the earth around us, absolutely, with other people, with a sense of context. And that's, I'd say, I would say, what, what so many things aren't doing at the moment. Even eco-projects, that's not what they're doing. They're doing something else. They're doing a sort of a, an efficiency thing. And one of the things, certainly that English is very good at, I feel, is, is convincing people um, of the significance of words like efficiency as being really important. But actually, what we're talking about here is something else. It's a sort of ethics thing. And maybe English isn't very good at expounding and explaining to people what those ideas mean. So this sense of interdependency with our situation. And this is the second point, I suppose. It's that ideas and expectations and practice aren't just shaped by consumerism, that there are other fashion systems at play. And all of these images that I've shown you are examples of those other fashion systems. They're not particularly well articulated. They're not necessarily able to be scaled up. Um, money can be made out of some of them, absolutely, and others not. They're probably quite slow to enact. Um, but the fact that uh, these people are doing them, I suppose, is a, is a real seed of hope, I would say. Um, and just before I end, I realise that I'm horribly running over, but there's sort of so much to say. I would just like to take you on a bit of a detour, if I may, and a weird sideways tangential leap to the world of town planning. Um, where I live, uh, in the north of England, um, in fact, Linda's also from the north of England, so we feel like we're ruling, we're rocking here um, this morning. Um, where I live, there's been um, a change recently, not in the village I live in, but in a couple of villages away, a place called Poynton. Um, there's been a real change. Um, there's been an introduction of something that's called a shared space. So there were two small roundabouts. That's a, a picture from above. Two small roundabouts that met. Do you even have roundabouts in? And this is you do. OK. Some places, they don't really know what they are. OK, so we have two ra small roundabouts that met. And you know, it used to be loads and loads and loads of traffic lights and, and, and just chaos. And they made a very bold move. They redesigned this intersection based on the ideas of a very uh, fabulous Dutch radical guy called Hans Moderman. And he had this idea that actually what we needed to do was do something very different in order to cut um, road accidents and other things. And he, it was called shared space. So what Moderman suggested you had to do at an intersection like this is that you had to strip away all the street furniture and all the signage, remove all of that, and level out the road and the pavement so that it was at the same height. And um, effectively, what they did, I mean, you can see that there's just a, a line of curb there, but it's not a raised line anymore. And in this area, there was a simple sign said that said, everybody within this area has equal priority. And so what happens now in this place in Poynton is remarkable. Is that you go into Poynton, and immediately you, you approach this double roundabout thing, Everybody stops because suddenly everyone's like, oh my goodness, what, how do we behave here? Well, what do we do? There's no signs that tell us which way to go. Is this a roundabout? Who's got priority? And then there's people walking, cyclists zipping in and out. And everybody suddenly has a very, very different attitude. And you realize that actually it takes a bit more time to get through this junction at Poynton. But ultimately you get to where you want to go. But a very important change has happened. Because in not knowing what to do, in there being no signs to tell you which way to turn, you had to do something which was very interesting. You had to start taking responsibility for other people. You no longer could divest responsibility, outsource it to the road signs and the rules of the road. You actually had to internalize the business of watching out for everybody else. And so what we see in a road junction like this is that this small change a change in the signals that you'll broadcast and receive help people perhaps affect an important change of internalizing the business of watching out for other people. And in a way, I think that that's what we have to do with fashion. We have to change some of the signals that were broadcast and received around fashion and sustainability. We can't just have more of the same where we're locked into the same rules, going along the same roads, making, giving way to the same people at the same time. 
actually, we almost need a bit of a shock. We almost need to suddenly be... No, no, you have to take responsibility for yourself here. And when we do pay attention to the needs of others and start a broader morality of taking care, a sense of taking care for others and a responsibility for others, I would suggest that a very different sector will emerge. Um, OK, I think, standing there, I think that's probably... I'm going to stop. I could say so much more, but OK. Thank you.